It's sometimes very hard to tell a computer what something is. So it's very hard to program a computer. And one example was this. It's, ve it's very hard to tell a computer what a tufa is. Something as simple as this is actually quite hard. But on the other hand, it's easy to tell a computer, here's a bunch of tufas. Now you should know what a tufa is. Here is an example and a label. And it's possible to get a computer to then learn um, what uh, something is. If we are able to solve problems like computer vision and perception um, and understanding language, um, this is the way to go. Okay. Um, we will never, especially because we are not capable of looking inside our heads um, and the things that we think are hard, like logic, um, they're actually quite easy, it turns out. After years, uh, centuries of investigation, that's what we've learned. That the, the simplest problems, like walking and seeing, are the hardest. It's no surprise that a third of your brain is dedicated to just that simple thing, seeing. Now, today I will show more examples of this, of where you, you capitalize on data to do well. We saw, we saw two examples where there's a lot of data. One is speech recognition, because 
um, people often um, produce a lot of data. Uh, so there exists in the world a lot of data that's like sound waves um, in files and the words that is being said in the file. So there's a lot of this um, label data so that makes it very easy for us to, to learn to train uh, a speech recognizer. Um, so some of you when you download the Microsoft software for speech recognition would have found out that it asks you to read a few sentences. And if you read a few sentences it gets better. Okay? And essentially what's happening there is you're providing this with supervision. It basically, the, the, it's sort of the program is smart. It gives you the labels and then you give it the data that goes with the labels by speaking. And the advantage of doing that for each individual specifically is that we all have very funny accents, like me. Um, and so if you can actually teach the computer your funny accent, the computer will be much better at understanding um, how you do. The key to, in fact, successful speech recognition will be that when you correct Siri. Because as you correct Siri, Siri will get better and speech recognition will be a solved problem um, not too far in the future. Um, Google is certainly pumping a lot of money uh, into it and so is Microsoft and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what their actual approaches are um, at present. I visited both groups over the summer and to gain a bit of insight into what they're doing. Um, the other problem is machine translation and again, for example, in the Canadian Parliament every time something gets said in French it gets translated to English and vice versa. Uh, probably even more so given the last election. Um, and so that just has left us with a lot of data in two languages. So, so it's, it, we've labeled what goes with what. And so we can use that data to train a translation. Linguists for many years tried to come up with very sophisticated models that would tell you how to go from say Mandarin to um, Hindu or in any other languages. And that actually turned out to be very hard to get right. And then people come with these extremely simple machine learning ideas, um, some of which um, you'll see in this course and it's possible to build a very good speech recognition system just by relying on the data and building the system bottom up as opposed to trying to engineer the system. And translation is actually an extremely important um, thing to do in business. Um, many companies in downtown, so company X, um, let's think of one, let's say uh, Lululemon or Aritzia, clothing companies in Vancouver. Um, where do they get their materials? Some come from Turkey, some come from Portugal, some come from India. Where is the labor done in terms of stitching your Aritzia clothes? Anyone can guess that one? China. Now imagine um, Lululemon Aritzia employees sitting on their desk has to send emails to Okay, we need those textiles from India. Email someone in India. Um, what about that dude in Portugal? Gonzalo, send me your whatever. And, um, oh wait, there's a problem with this factory in China, so we're going to have to reroute um, this ship to go to this other city instead of that city to get the clothes on. Now, the problem with this is that that person probably only speaks one or two languages and is dealing with people that speak, you know, is dealing with four different countries and the only thing that saves these people and allows commerce to happen is the fact that there's automatic translation software. And companies rely heavily on it and, you know, a lot of e-commerce is made possible thanks to that. So even um, what seem to be simple applications actually have a huge profound impact in our world. Okay, so today I wanted to talk a bit about um, two things. Um, the first is about the brain inspiration behind, uh, because a lot of the algorithms we're going to look at later, like neural networks and so on, it's, we're sort of inspired by our desire to understand the brain and to understand mind. 
And that's certainly what drives me to stay as a professor, to work as a professor, because I get to do research on that, <coughs> as opposed to tripling my salary working for Google. Um, so there is a true desire to understand. Um, ultimately, if you understand your brain, you understand a lot about yourself and the, and the world and how you perceive it. Um, so I love those illusions that that allow me to introspect, to get an idea of how my head might be working. Um, and looking into the brain and doing some experiments, either whether it's fMRI, so typically there'll be three kinds of experiments. These days we can get fMRI, which is sort of coarse, but nonetheless can help us see a few things, understand a few things about the brain. Um, the other thing we do is we experiment with animals, um, and you'll see some pictures of what gets done. Um, experimenting with humans is not allowed. It used to be done, and a lot was learned by experimenting with humans. Um, and even experimenting with animals these days is a bit dodgy. And then the other thing we're going to see is, oops, speaking of animals. Uh, the other, the other uh, thing that we use to understand more about the brain is we look at patients that have um, that are just different. Okay? Whether they're different in a way that is an enhancement or whether they're different in a way that is a shortcoming. So people with schizophrenia, people with different agnosias, um, different mental um, disorders or enhancements um, are often the subject of a lot of these experiments. But let me tell you a little bit about what we know and I'll tell you about one particular experiment that tells a lot, um, tells us a lot about how we can build machines that can see. And, and this is essentially the line of work that was followed by um, a lot of researchers, mostly in Canada, and in, that led eventually to a publication this summer of Google in the front page of the New York Times. So who saw the cat picture, Google cat thing? Google learns to recognize cats on YouTube. This thing was huge. It hit all the news. It was front page of the New York Times. So it was like big achievement of AI. Um, so here is what they did. Um, let's start by understanding. OK, so some background. Um, you have your eye, and you have photoreceptors in your eye. And then those photoreceptors get connected. You know, they just have fibers that go through, you know, basically two optic nerves that actually cross and project to the back. Um, to give you an idea of the image resolution, there, are, uh, there is one million fibers going through here. So roughly a thousand by thousand image, that's what goes through. It starts much bigger here, but then it gets reduced, and then it actually increases here, which is kind of strange. So it actually ramifies into a lot of uh, uh, more neurons to represent the image. The image gets represented in a decoded fashion. What I mean by a decoded <coughs> fashion is that if you have um, if you have an image that is, let's say, um, this guy here, um, this will be represented as an image that consists of this plus one times maybe this plus one times this plus you know zero times this plus zero times this plus and so on. So you have an image in your visual field, which is like your mama's face. Um, that's the first thing you usually pay attention to in your life. And then you're breaking that image into parts. And each neuron is taking care of one of these parts. Okay? 
And how do we know that we do that here in this area? Um, thanks to the following experiment. Um, so Hubel and Wiesel, uh, a few decades ago, uh, put an electrode on a cat. And by the way, uh, Hubel and Wiesel, um, I strongly recommend you Google it and watch the videos online. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of very good stuff in YouTube about Hubble and Wiesel. So you can see the original experiments there in great detail. Um, you, you implant an electrode to measure the firing pattern of a neuron. And then this is what they found. When they were showing a grating to a cat, when this grating happened to be at a particular orientation, at a particular angle, this neuron, so essentially this is the firing of a neuron. This neuron started firing like crazy at a certain angle. But as you move away from that angle, the neuron stops firing. So you have a neuron that will only fire when it, when it sees uh, vertical or, or vertical or horizontal and so on image. So neurons are selective to little parts of the image. So neurons, in fact, are, there will, there's a neuron that fires when it sees this. There's another neuron that fires when it sees this. When you see this happy face, you would have one, two, three neurons firing. But these other neurons wouldn't be firing. So that's sort of, at the core, very coarse level, what's going on. And so each neuron is essentially one of these different little images. Neuron that fires with the blue, one with the yellow, and so on. Actually, the sound is not projecting, but let me use my microphone. Those are the neurons firing. And they fire when the light coincides with those three dots. If the, if the grating is perpendicular to the orientation of the blocks, the neuron doesn't fire. It only fires when it coincides. It's very cool to watch the whole video. I recommend you go to YouTube and see the rest. We also know that our neurons that fire depending on your location. Right now there is a neuron that's telling me what I am in the world and where I'm oriented. I know what I am and what I'm looking because of certain uh, um, firing pattern. Um, again, how do we know that? We put electrodes in the brain of a rat, like you see here, in this lab rat. And then the rat walks around the maze, as you can see, randomly. And then there's a neuron that only fires every time the rat goes into one of these periodic places. Okay. So neurons fire for in particular locations. And by doing this sort of thing, you're able to do, um, to know in which direction you're going and where you are. And in fact, if you close your eyes, you could just fire these neurons and you could plan your way to kids in your head. That's correct, yeah. Uh, you say that the brain is plastic, so when you say that the neuron is dedicated to this function, is that a malleable? Like, does it change? Is it a function of your like, experience? Or like, how, do you, how does that neuron get plotted? The brain is fascinating. Um, so if you lose those neurons, so first, it typically it's not just one neuron coding you have several neurons coding the same thing. And you would want several because every time you do this and you kill some neurons, um, you help yourself. Um, some neurons, so just like they're coding for parts, as we'll see as you go up in the hierarchy, you, will, you could get a neuron that fires this like famous paper called the Halleberry neuron, a neuron that fires when you, you see a picture of Halleberry. But you would want replication of that neuron because otherwise, if that neuron dies, you'll stop seeing Halleberry. <laughs> and neurons tend to die more than they're born, and they die at a very fast rate. Neurons are dying right now in your heads. 
Um, and I can't remember, but it's actually staggering the number of them that die. Exercise helps with, I think, getting neurons born in the hippocampus. Um, if you go drinking downtown, <laughs> you certainly kill a lot of your cerebellum. Um, so um, it is also true, and this is now part of the hypothesis so for learning, that if um, if a subject, for example, loses sight, and then there's this beautiful experiment where you take uh, a block with pins that sort of press so that the depth of the pins is the same as the depth of the 3D field in front of you, and you implant that in the tongue, then that even though you don't have a signal going from your eyes, that part of the brain will get recruited to deal with the signal coming here. So the subjects learn to see again. So the brain rewires itself so that subjects can see again by, you know, just by how much the pins press on their tongue. This depends on age. So also children are far more adaptable than adults. Um, and the, the sort of other interesting experiment that comes from Hubble and Wiesel this, this is kind of cruel. I try not to say this in class, but when you ask for it. So you, you take one kitty, and um, yeah, just don't ever tell my wife about this experiment. You cover one eye of the kitty from, you know, the actually there is a bit of a flaw in this experiment, but it's just sort of it now. When the kitty is born, but I think that might be too late. Because even when they're in the womb, they're already, there's already light. But somehow this worked. So, okay, don't quote me on this one because I can't remember the details right. But I think the argument is you cover one eye, and then they only see with one eye. And of course, the brain has two hemispheres, and so the two optic nerves cross to each of the back. And so you'll see that in one side, so for the eye that is um, that can that is not covered. The receptive fields, the special receptive fields, the co receptive fields, basically neurons that are selective to different orientations, they will form. Whereas for the other eye, you won't see that. You won't see that organization, which shows that you really are adapting and learning. So evolution gives us a lot of things. When we're born, we can move hands, we can do a lot of stuff. So a lot of stuff has been encoded through evolution, which I just see as another long term learning process. Uh, but as, we're, but as we start life, the brain has to be very adaptable. It has to reconfigure itself. There were two more. Apparently there's an experiment also with kitties, um, which they put in a box with uh, lines in it. And oh. the cat grows up within that box. And they found out that afterwards this cat has more neurons which uh, react uh, for lines in the environment. So it says that neurons are adapting to its environment. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you for reminding me of that experiment. Indeed, you put kitties on boxes that have vertical, I think it was fer well, kitties, ferrets, cute animals, in boxes with vertical bars, and you put some in boxes with horizontal bars, and that's all they see. And then you see that they will have four more of one. Depending on the environment in which they grow, they'll have different brains. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So, w w if you're not paying attention to something, your neurons will not fire. Okay, so, whatever stuff that you're using to commit thoughts to memory, if you're not paying attention to the teacher, it's just not going to get it. <laughs> then the neurons are not firing. Okay. Um, Another thing that's very important about how brains work that is very different than a classical computer, and it's essential to learn this to see how to build machine learning algorithms, and it's the fact that things are memory is associative. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, can I need a volunteer that will tell me their phone number? Who who's a good sport? Okay, quickly so that they can't get. It. Say it backward. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so thank you. Now, would that be an issue with a normal computer to say it backward or forward? No, because random access memory doesn't work like our memory. We store patterns. Okay, so if I tell you to remember, um, if you if you have to remember objects separately, it's very hard to remember long lists of objects. But if instead you see all those objects together forming a composition, it's a lot easier um, to remember. So we. We remember patterns. So our memory is more like this picture is saying, where we know patterns. These patterns might be um, occluded, like so it might be occluded by these clouds here. Um, but even though there is these clouds, we are able to retrieve the right object, the plane in this case. OK, so now here's very quick. Um, I'm going to go over this very quickly now because this is something that will be in the course. So this is sort of a teaser of things to come. Um, we do try to build models, which we call neural networks, that try to emulate how do we do this sort of thing, extract the little patterns of the world. And so here is, this is very similar to what I had before. It's an image. And let's assume it's a black and white image um, and a black and white image that is just 4 by 4 pixels. And let's assume that each of these um, circles here is a neuron. And this neuron fires every time it sees um, a vertical bar on the left. <coughs> this neuron fires for a diagonal bar. So this, for this particular image, there is one vertical bar. So the image fires, so there's a one. Whereas for this unit, um, there's no diagonal bar. So this unit doesn't fire. And then this unit fires because of this, um, and so on. So you get the idea. So each unit is looking, is firing for only one part of the image. Okay, so like one urine fires when I see his eyebrows, one for the hair, one for the t-shirt, and so on. Now, typically for images, those first neurons tend to look more like this. So this is the image in the input that will make a, this unit fire. If there's a little bit of white on the right of my visual field, um, a particular neuron will start going tick, 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 every time it encounters it. Okay. So now comes an interesting thing you can do. And this is sort of um, very new stuff a few years ago started. Um, in Toronto uh, with Jeff. Uh, so what Jeff tried to do, using techniques that we'll learn about in the course, um, he created a network. And this is essentially, we can think of this as a network, because you can think of these as nodes. And you can think of each pixel of the image as a node. And the edge is connecting each, each pixel to each um, of the circles is essentially forming a, a graph, sort of a bipartite graph, two sides. And so he summarizes it just like this. Instead of drawing all those edges, he just basically says there's 2,000 of these uh, neurons, and those 2,000 neurons are looking at a patch of an image. Okay, because remember, the size of the image that we actually see is kind of small, about a million pixels. And using the magic of learning that we were going to learn about in this course, you end up learning the values of the connections. And essentially, the values of connections, as we see in this picture, encode these, whether they're red or, white or yellow, encode when this neuron gets to fire. We will learn those guys. And if you do train this network by showing it many images, you end up with something that looks like this. And then Jeff had the idea of why don't we take the stuff that's out of here and feed it to another network? And let's train that separately. So then he goes and he trains this one. And he's like, well, let's do it again. And now let's look at these weights and see what they look like. And then 
Actually, this comes from a different experiment of uh, Hong Lak Lee. Uh, then he says, oh, we're getting parts, eyes, mouths, things like that. And then you train more. And this is not done with just one image. It's done, the training is done with many, many, many images, thousands of images. And then right at the top, you start getting these neurons. Now, you cannot put, in a way, because you're training these one by one, you can put them all together, right? Because these 2,000 happen to be the same as these 2,000. And so that's what I've done here. And so what Jeff did there as an experiment was, let's assume that I have this image. If I multiply each pixel by this, these weights, and I get the firing of the neurons, and I pass it through this and get the firing of a thousand neurons and keep doing it and then invert the process, will I get back the face? And you don't get the face perfectly, but you get this face. Now what's really cool about this? How many bits do we need to code for, to code for that face? Thirty. If you knew these thirty numbers, <coughs> now you can forget about everything else. If you knew these thirty numbers and you have this neural network which you, you've learned through a lot of time, by, use, by changing these thirty numbers you can generate different faces. Okay, so this is coding a face in just thirty numbers. It's pretty good compre image compression. Um, we will learn in the course that instead of going through this very long roundabout process, what we might do is we might just construct a network that looks like this, a very big network. And then we will learn a technique that will just basically say, when I see this input, I want to see it as an output. So now we don't have supervision anymore. We don't have like the French English in translation, but basically you're saying that when I see this image, and it goes into my head, and if I close my eyes, I should still be able to see that image. Because if I don't see it, like suppose I close my eyes, oh, I'm seeing like this unicorn floating, and then I open my eyes, oh, I don't see the unicorn floating, so I better start learning. That's not the world, Land of come on, calculate. And then eventually when my image of the world matches the image of the world, I have learned. And that's what learning is about here, is about making sure that the input is the same as the output. Okay. And you're training this via bottleneck. This is what Google has been doing. And they use this because they want to learn every time you upload a video on YouTube, they want to automatically extract what is the video about. Okay. So that's the future. The real cool work is going to be more and more intelligence in applications in um, YouTube because that's where there's lots of data. Look, you, why would I care about doing that? Facebook would love to look at your pictures and know who you hang out with and know which clothes you're wearing because they would know which clothes to try to sell to you, for example. Okay, so that's, um, now we get to the Google and I got these slides from a friend, uh, Mark Aurelio Ranzato. Um, and so Google indeed, what they did is they, they trained such a network which basically they show an image and they say, I want you to output the same image. That thing is called an autoencoder, sort of autoencodes itself. There's no supervision, but essentially the world is my supervision. And by the way, that's related to some mental diseases. Because when some people start seeing aliens and the CIA is after them, um, it's not, it's because their brain is been coded to do things like that. We all suffer to some extent of schizophrenia. And if you, when they see the alien there, they truly see it because there's no way of them knowing whether that image is being generated from their brain or whether it's coming from there. And we already know that we really are not seeing this. We're only seeing parts of it. Most of it is imagined. And so they exploited this and they tried to train it and then they just took millions of images, possibly billions, I can't remember. There were billions of parameters. There's W's, there's billions of these. Huge network. So they have to distribute it across 16,000 cores. So 
like massive uh, uh, training. Um, and, um, and essentially what they found is by after doing this, some of those neurons in those thirty neurons in the bottleneck, they become sensitive to only a few signals. So there was a neuron that would fire uh, for these images, for example. So if you show this network, neural network, a bunch of things, random things from YouTube, it will learn to faces. It will learn that faces is an important thing to pay attention in YouTube. And then the other thing that it learned that was important was kitties. And no surprise there. Although some things kind of look up like a face, but not quite a face. Um, and this is sort of the view of the, this neuron. Anything that looks like this sort of scary face will make that neuron fire. And the, the same idea of having a network can be applied in video, where you could have a sequence of gazes where you're just looking here, there, there, and you try to reconstruct the whole thing. But the picture of the scary face is probably like one of the babies begin with, right? Um, okay, what babies see is, um, so then it's more like, babies do, okay, um, hmm. babies do quickly are able to identify their mother. Mm -hmm. So that's one part of vision that is very quick. They're able to track fingers slowly, uh, very slowly, it's like they can't track a finger fast. They tend to focus on the edges, and I believe that's, this is my own conjecture, that they're just learning those edges. Um, it's a long time since I read about developmental vision, but um, it's within two weeks, three weeks, most of it gets developed. Amazing. Although these receptive fields would go on to like six years. So. All right, so let's go into applications. And I'm going to show you a few applications. So the learning approach. Learning is good because you can't tell a computer what a giraffe is, right? You'll agree that this is a giraffe, but try telling a computer how to code that. Um, or this guy or that guy. So instead, what we do is we just go to YouTube, we get lots of crazy images of giraffe like this, and we tell the computer that's a giraffe. And then using the magic of machine learning that we will learn in this course, which will require that we learn a little bit of math, but that math will be easy, um, we will be able to sort of learn to do this. Now, What we've seen so far, often we have a lot of data, like for translation, or we can try to reproduce the same thing. But let's assume you want to build a face detector. Okay. Now, a few years ago, I was on a consulting trip to Japan and uh, was working on uh, with, with a company there, and they were trying to build um, you know, face detectors as a car company, and they want to know where you're looking because they want to know whether your eyes are blinking and stuff so you're not falling asleep and whether you're checking your blind spot and all that. And one of my friends, uh, I think of Scottish descent, was there. So I tried it and it worked beautifully. He knew where my face was. And then he tried it and it completely failed. And we were like all baffled because it works with all the engineers in Japan. It works with me. And then we look at Jesse. Jesse has blonde eyebrows. And that's why, and that's what happens when you try to code the things by hand. You don't think of all the cases. Um, these days, what we do is we create a huge database of faces. Um, we outsource the labeling of these faces. So someone just basically crops faces and says this is a face, this is a face. And sadly enough, in the world there's enough cheap labor to do this. And once you have this huge database of faces, you can tell the system these are faces. And then machine learning should be enough to be able to then do this, to detect what a face is. 
And that's essentially the approach that made this possible. Now, all of you probably here have a camera of some sort. I would say 90% of you do at this point in time. Um, and most of those cameras have this, certainly if you have an iPhone. We would like to build cars that don't run over pedestrians. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we'd like to do that is because in the United States alone, um, last year, and the year before, and the year before, and the year before, every year 40,000 um, people die. Okay, think of the population of UBC, add a few more thousand people, and that's the number of people that die every year in the US alone. In India, when I checked the figure last time, it was 113,000. Uh, however you normalize this, this, these are huge numbers. Um, driving is barbaric and we should not drive because we're not capable. Oh, and by the way, it's mostly pedestrians who die. And, uh, and yes, you, usually the, the drivers are young people. Um, we would, regardless, we would like to move to having automated cars because the right thing is that if you go out and you had one glass of wine but you've never drank and that glass of wine was enough to make you tipsy, you should just press that button or you should just say, Siri, drive me home. <laughs> Maybe press a button because your voice probably, if you're that drunk. <laughs> And so that's the only responsibility you have to have is or maybe before you even have that drink, make sure that that car's been set to drive you home automatically. Now that car has to see, that's the biggest problem. Pressing a pedal, turning a wheel, that's easy, those are relatively okay control problems. But getting that car to see and understand what it's seeing is hard. Like I said, a third of our brain is just dedicated to seeing. It can't be an easy thing because it would be wasteful because the brain is the organ in the body that consumes the most energy. So it would be absolutely wasteful to have a third of that structure wasting so much energy. We, it's that big because it's that hard to see. This is what some companies do. And um, they collect lots of images of pedestrians or of the back of trucks, as we'll see. And so the cars learn, just the same as with cameras, they learn to detect these objects and they're able to drive automatically. And, and just yesterday I learned actually from Ian, one of my colleagues here, that now you know, Google's actually got a license and soon we will have these automatic cars in the street. I'm looking forward to one of them. So as you can see, here's a product. This is uh, Mobileye, a company that's working with many car manufacturers. And this technology is already available on, on this particular brand of car. And, you know, this car basically as it drives on the highway, knows where the lanes are, it knows where the backs of the cars are. It even has 3D <coughs> models for the cars. And this is wonderful, because next time we need to drive on the highway, we just switch automatic. And you have the freedom of a car without um, killing people. <laughs> 40,000, it's not a small number. Okay, so those were uh, applications in vision. And um, another application that's sort of interesting is just text. The web, and that's where the money is, because the web is full of text. And text, we know how to do things with. Um, the first text application of sort of big impact was Google and which you learn about all about Google just by doing that um, homework exercise. So make sure you go to the tutorials. The TAs will be there. They will be going through the exercise with you. They will cover that, you know, go over all the Python. So, and if you have trouble installing it, the TAs will help you with installing, but hopefully they'll have time to actually go over the material. And so it's an exercise about learning Python, and in the process you learn about how to implement a search engine. Um, I think I'll take some time to go a little bit over it too in class. Now, and by the way, in terms of programming, that's the most intensive homework of the year. So we're starting high. I'm going to try to bring that down in terms of work. But, and the reason why it has to be that way is because the, there is a sort of a step of learning Python in the course. 
But Python is very widely used. It's, it's a script language, so it's not as hard as Java or anything like that. So it's very easy to use. And it's very good for web applications. If you want to build like, um, I don't know, a startup doing some sort of text mining or a web page that learns to the preferences of what movies people like or, or what shoes people like or which kit is rated the highest, you would want to know Python. <laughs> And what, what you can do with machine learning, you can actually take words and you can project words to what I'm going to call semantic spaces. And later in the course, you'll, I'm actually, we're actually going to do those exercises. We're going to get to implement this, where we know which, how words are related to each other. And make sure that I'm not going over time. I'm OK. Oh, they're both, I'm not going to go into the which language is better. They're both good languages. <laughs> just, just to uh, uh, figure out if you're going to implement something. If you know Python and you know all your Java and you know you're in good shape and C. Just, Python's a good language. Just one more. But machine learning is a good one. And it's free. Um, so. One of the things we care about in text, for example, is we want to know relations about things. Um, how is one thing related to another thing? So these days we're able to automatically extract from the web um, and what we call entities, which are the things that exist. Think of them as Wikipedia titles. Every Wikipedia title is a thing that exists that we talk about. Um, but of course, this Wikipedia is small. It's only two million. Uh, where this is not even the size of the population of the planet. So there's a lot more things we talk about than the things that exist in Wikipedia. And so when you want to do text mining and you have to go to the real web and deal with billions of entities as opposed to just millions. Um, and what you also want to learn is relations between entities because it might be more interesting to know that um, this restaurant is related to this other restaurant because the pad tie is better there and it's cheaper. Okay? So you want to learn the better than, um, I don't know, Veach is better than Rangoli, something like that. And Veach is more expensive than Rangoli, stuff like that. Okay. And so using very similar machine learning techniques with, to the neural networks that you've seen, um, several researchers have been working on this problem of. Like, for example, given to an entity, people, that's the input. So this is now an example of what can be done. If the input is people, and if you give it a, a relation, like a verb, for example, build, destroy, this is what the model predicts. Okay, so if, if you're trying to build products for people on the web, um, and if you see something and a relation, you can predict what the other something will be. And it could be something crazy, it could be something useful. Um, but certainly text mining, understanding what web pages are saying is one of sort of the big hot things in millions of startups doing machine learning and text mining. News recommendation, uh, my own students, like I mentioned, they sold a company to CNN for many millions of dollars and many more have similar companies. So machine learning is kind of... Um, in the bubble right now. Um, another sort of common application of machine learning where people use the same autoencoders, the same neural network ideas, is in, um, in speech where you have a sound wave. You do some very simple pre-processing um, to the sound wave. You convert it to a signal where you can see its frequency content uh, over time frames. And then you just feed this into a neural network and you just learn it. And then it outputs a sequence of words. Okay? And that's essentially what um, Google um, is doing. Um, they're training these neural networks using all their data that people have been providing for speech recognition. Um, Microsoft is doing the same thing. Um, huge mass of neural networks, so you need to know how to distribute the computation, how to distribute the data. 
um, but provided you do that well, you're able to um, come up with very good speech recognition, which is just getting better every day, because the more data we give them, the, the easier it gets. So these are the sort of things that you can um, go and do once you know machine learning, or at least these are the things that when you see them on the media, you will understand how it's done. Or if you play with Kinect, how does Kinect know that my hand is here and that I'm standing like this? It's because Kinect actually uses, again, millions of training data of all the human poses. And it just learns um, uh, from that data what your pose is based on the, their depth count. Um, it's the most sold consumer electronic out there. And it's essentially an application of machine learning. Um, so there's all sorts of cool applications. You take the course, you will be able to learn the technology behind um, those. The speech recognition, um, does it keep learning as you're speaking to it, or is it all programmed before? It keeps learning. Yeah. yeah. So that's the key thing that, um, this is what makes Google great. And a lot of, because they, they, some companies understood that they have to keep learning. That every time you get a customer interaction, it's a chance to learn. That's why they suck all your data. It's not just because they like to invade your privacy, but because indeed they can provide a better service if they keep taking your data. All right, guys, have a good weekend. Um, I'll take care.